So let's get started. So pollinator gardens in the town of Mashpee and the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge. So today we're going to go over what is pollination, what is a pollinator, why is it important that we care, and how we have helped in town and the refuge and how you can help at home. Okay, so what is pollination? Does anybody know? What is pollination? Venture a guess? Even adults? <laughs> All right, well, I will tell you. It is how flowers reproduce or create more flowers. It is the movement of pollen from one flower to the next. And how does this occur? It can, it can happen through wind, it can happen through the water, or it can happen through the transfer of, uh, with the help of animals. So as you can see here, um, the insect, or excuse me, the animal lands on the first flower and um, it ends up getting pollen uh, it, it ends up uh, transferring the pollen. Uh, when it eats the nectar, um, it ends up rubbing against the stamen, which is part of the flower that has the pollen. And then when it flies to the next flower, it transfers that pollen, and um, that is how the uh, new flowers are created. So what is a pollinator? A pollinator is an animal that moves pollen from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma of a flower. So it is, uh, it does uh, need males and females in the reproduction. Um, and which of these animals are pollinators? So uh, does anybody think there, no, any of these animals aren't pollinators? Or do you want to answer, hon? Which, one, which ones of these are pollinators? A bee. A bee. Very good. We got a bee up there. Any other types of pollinators that we know of? Yes, very good. Very good. Any other ones that we know of? Bat. Yes, very good. Very good. And any other guesses? Okay, great. Well, you, you were just about there. With them all, these, these actually all are pollinators here. So as you were saying, we have birds, we have bats, we have butterflies, we have bees and beetles, and also certain types of flies even. So it's not just bees like sometimes people think. It's a, a, a wide variety of insects do pollinate and are very important. So here, for local species, for birds, we have hummingbirds that pollinate. Uh, for moths, we have luna moths. For butterflies, we have monarchs here. We have painted ladies, which we'll see later. Um, spice bush swallowtails. For bees, we have our bumblebees, our honeybees, sweat bees, mason bees, leaf cutter bees, all types of bees. I didn't even know there was all these types of bees until I started working in pollinator gardens. Beetles, uh, we, there's blister beetles, and there are bee flies as well. So why are they important? Pollinators are important to a lot of our favorite foods that we eat. Um, they are responsible for almost three quarters of the crops that we, uh, for pollinating uh, three quarters of the crops that uh, we grow, um, we grow here that uh, make up again a, a lot of our food. Uh, and uh, they're, <clears throat> excuse me. They uh, get people outside uh, when you do plant beautiful gardens to attract them, uh, which makes people happier. Um, and when you have native plants, uh, you attract two times as many birds. Um, so many pollinators are food for birds and dragonflies and just are generally an important part of the food web. So what's the concern? Why are they, why are they in trouble? So unfortunately, pollinators are declining because of habitat loss um, and uh, pesticide use, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. So in order to combat that, we can do things at home ourselves. We can limit our use of pesticides. We can uh, start to 
add um, more native species into our gardens and we can get rid of any type of species that are invasive that um, may harm uh, pollinators. So pollinators need nectar and pollen, which is what uh, is produced with the flower. Um, and they need to have a source of food year round from spring to fall. So there are certain plants that are best for pollinators. They need to be native. Well, they don't need to be, but it's <laughs> it is ideal that they are native. Um, so they have already adapted to this uh, habitat, to this type of uh, temperature and weather and all of the other animals and plants that have evolved here in, in, in New England. Um, Again, uh, we want to get a uh, variety of species, some that bloom early in early spring, some in the summer, and some in the fall. Uh, blue, purple, and yellow flowers are, uh, seem to be especially attractive to pollinators. Um, flat or shallow blossoms attract the most types of bees, and that's because they have a very uh, a, a good place to, to land um, and, and pollinate. Uh, and uh, Easy plants to grow too, to start with, um, are, are from the mint family. They attract a lot of different types of bees. And you want to avoid hybrid plants and non-native species for the most part. So for example, in the spring, some fun ones to plant are heather, crocus, holly, dandelion, which you don't really have to plant dandelion. Those ones will show up and <laughs> propagate as much as uh, possible. Um, but with that said, though, a special note about dandelions, they are somewhat regarded as a weed. It's understood that not every, they're not really a wanted plant in your garden, uh, in your lawn um, for a lot of people. And same with clovers. But not only um, if you have more of those in your lawn, there's less maintenance. Um, it also provides uh, some of the first source of nectar for the bees in the early spring. The, the first blooming dandelions too. So even if you do you know, want to cut them down later in the season, it's good to at least let them bloom and, uh, and proliferate for a little while. Um, and that goes also for clover. As you, all, as you all know, you probably have it in your gardens, as, I mean in your lawns as well, but that also can be uh, fairly um, minimal uh, maintenance and also provides um, good food for, for the pollinators and also bunnies. Bunnies come and eat them, and they're very cute. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, those are some good species for the spring and the summer. Um, we got tick seed, lupine, uh, squashes, corn, lavender, clethra, butterfly weed, milkweed. Milkweed is blooming right now. Um, there is a uh, a large effort um, nationwide to to propagate milkweed. Um, we'll we'll get into that a little bit later, and also. Um, after the presentation, uh, we can go over it on the uh, poster and with the uh, helpers we have today too. But that's uh, it, it's really um, it's extremely important to them. And in late summer, uh, there's Joe Pieweed, uh, Leatris, Mints, Coneflower, and Sunflower. And in the fall, Sedum, Montauk Daisies, New England Asters, and different types of Goldenrod are really uh, uh, really important and bloom at that time. So what are the relationships between the pollinators and the native flowering plants? So again, uh, some, uh, the most popular example that we all think of are uh, in, in the forefront of people's minds, again, is our, our monarchs. Um, and their host plant is milkweed. Unfortunately, milkweed as its name implied, is considered a weed by a lot of people. They've been sprayed um, on the highways. Uh, they they are considered a nuisance species um, in landscaping for some. For some, and uh, so unfortunately, their numbers have declined quite significantly. But monarchs are, are are specialist species in that they can only eat, um, and they can only reproduce on milkweed. So if there's no milkweed, there's no monarchs. 
And as I said, right now they're blooming. Um, I don't think I have a good image in here. There are some images on the uh, on the poster. Um, so you can see uh, what they look like and, and go find them uh, out blooming now. So they do require, um, so again, just to continue with the monarch example, they do require um, milkweed uh, for the duration of their migration um, where they go all the way from Canada to Mexico. And another example of a, a pollinator and its host plant are painted ladies, which we have here today. Um, those are the butterflies that we will be releasing. And uh, they are a very interesting species. Um, they are not a specialist like the monarch. A lot of different plants can help the, the um, painted lady. A lot of different uh, plants can host their eggs and, uh, and they can also eat many different plants, whereas the monarch is very specific to milkweed. Um, they are, they occur almost in every continent and they have the longest migration of any insect up to 9,000 miles. They can go from the Arctic Circle all the way down to the Sahara Desert in one trip, which I, if you look at the size of them, it's pretty remarkable. It's hard to even imagine that it's, that, that can happen, but, but it does. So they're a very amazing species and the more I learn about them, the more they almost seem like a little celebrity that we have here. <laughs> So uh, this is just an example of other host plants for different butterflies. So again, these are the plants that you're going to want to plant to attract these certain types of butterflies. Um, with that said, though, you just need to keep in mind that these are also going to be food for those caterpillars of those butterflies. So they will be eaten, so, that's, uh, so you'll want to keep that into account. <laughs> it's not necessarily for just aesthetics but uh you know you can always plant quite a, quite a few of them as well too so you can have some aesthetic purposes um so for example here just the painted lady these are a few of the host plants hollyhock pearly everlasting um thistle hollyhock sunflower so today we will be planting the sunflower seeds so that'll be uh once those guys bloom and flower so hopefully you'll you'll get some painted ladies of your own to your house So what have we done in town and in the refuge? Um, we have uh, planted four different pollinator gardens in town. And within the town, um, there's the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, which I'll get into in just a moment. But if you can see here over to the right, um, I where there's a big, sun, or big sunflower, that's where we have the gardens in town. And part of the rationale for um, for their distribution, or for where they are located here in town, um, they you we're trying to create a corridor of food, like a, a connected food source for them. Um, so this was added. Uh, this was the last one added. Um, so it doesn't really go in that same vein per se. But uh, these three gardens. This one's at Pickerel Cove. Uh, this is at the Community Gardens in Mashpee, the Community Gardens Garden. <laughs> and the Jehu Pond Gardens. So again, um, yes, it, it, so it's, uh, so we're trying to achieve that connected uh, food habitat. So um, that, uh, so it, what, what is really helpful um, to supplement these large gardens that we have created are any gardens in between that anybody uh, in residential areas have as well. Uh, so, these three again, they're in the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, and um, a lot of the funding for that work has uh, come from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which uh, is um, the, how the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, um, oh, excuse me. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. I'll just, the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge was created in 1995 um, and it's located in the towns of Mashpee and Falmouth. Uh, a lot of people don't know we have a National Wildlife Refuge here um, in Mashpee, so I always, uh, you know, it's definitely something that um, I like to make people aware of. And again, a lot of the 
the funding and a lot of the help did come from the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service too for, for the creation of these gardens. Um, so that's just a little background on the, on the refuge. Uh, so uh, we'll just go into the three garden, the four gardens that we have. So um, these were created all in, 20, in 2013 with the Friends of the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, AmeriCorps Cape Cod, the town of Mashpee, and um, Talbot's Ecological Land Care. So uh, these are just a few pictures of how these gardens were created. They were, uh, they were chosen um, specifically for uh, certain um, characteristics. Um, but this one is the, the northernmost, if you will, of the, of the, poll of the pollinator gardens. And uh, just a couple uh, example species here that uh, uh, from some images I took from that garden is a, are, are a bee fly, which is on the aster on the right there. And those are kind of fun in that they mimic a, a bee, but they're a fly, but they still do pollinate. Um, and uh, they're just a very, very cool looking insect. And then um, there's of course our bumblebee friend down on a, a, a mint in the middle there. <clears throat> And uh, this is the southernmost garden here is the Jehu Pond Garden. So these are just some pictures of, uh, of the creation of the garden and the installation of the guardrail and the, and the signs. Um, and these are another uh, more close-up images of some of the uh, flowers we have there and the um, insects, the pollinators, excuse me. We also have the gardens here at the Mashpee Community Gardens. And these are just a couple pictures from there. And uh, there's our star in the middle there is a painted lady. Um, I remember coming across quite a few, especially later in the summer, early fall. Um, they seem to really love these asters. <laughs> and those are just a few more images of the uh, garden there. And then the last garden that we put up a couple, which is not in the ref is not in the boundaries of the refuge, but uh, the last garden that we put up is at Santua Pond Preserve off of Route 130. And there we added a small garden underneath the sign. Um, and we also added, oh, excuse me, we also added there, in, in addition to just the, the, um, the smaller uh, herbaceous type of flowers, we also added some, uh, some crab apple trees and viburnum bushes there too, which are also really important species for wildlife. They provide food and, um, food and habitat and, uh, and nectar. Um, so uh, a couple, uh, items that we also have in these gardens um, that uh, help the pollinators are uh, habitat supplements, which uh, take the form of these pollinator boxes, um, where uh, they uh, mimic the habitat for uh, mason and leafcutter bees. Um, for Just as, as an example, um, who uh, naturally nest in tunnels in dead trees and, and holes in dead trees. So this, uh, this helps uh, attract the pollinators and also, like I said, gives them a, um, a place to, to, to uh, have babies and a, good, and a food source that's very close by. So they're not, the, the point of the gardens isn't just for the food, it also does provide them habitat and a place to reproduce. Um, there were many pollinator grants that were received uh, through the Friends of the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge. Um, uh, and uh, if, if you have questions about those after the presentation, I can I can help you. Um, I can help you then. Um, and here's the, and the real question today: is how can you help? So you're. Uh, one of the first things you can do is to go check out these gardens that we already have and to see um, what species are there and which ones are your favorites. Um, they are all helpful and again, they're all uh, planted very deliberately to have those species that bloom early spring into the summer and, and, and the fall. So if you go at different times a year too, you can see firsthand how the species change over time, but how important it is to always have something blooming. 
Um, so uh, again, you can start small. Every little bit helps, even just getting some milkweed seeds on, online. Uh, they, there are a few places that you can um, get those, and I think they're even for free. Um, you want, again, you want to get the, a variety. You want to get the different color blooms uh, that we mentioned. Um, of course, nectar producing, native, and as I said, bloom all season. So, uh, and, and when you do plant your own garden, or, the, your, um, or even if it's just a couple species, it'd be helpful to uh, register it at the Million Pollinator Gardens, um, the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge, uh, where anyone can help. Um, so it, the ultimate goal is to have a million pollinator gardens register nationwide. Um, so uh, I think they're approaching a million, but of course, every bit helps. And these are just a few sources. Uh, these are just a few um, places that you can uh, order seeds and um, and find out different butterfly and host plants and uh, different places to collect seeds. And this is also another uh, uh, examples of a, of a resource of pollinator resources, butterfly gardening. I actually have these the attractive attracting native pollinator books over there. If anyone's interested in looking, um, the pollinator conservation handbook by the Xerxes Society is also very helpful too. So just to sum up, um, you know, create a garden for monarchs and native pollinators, spread the word, and thank you for coming. And thank you to the friends of the Mashpee National Wildlife Refuge, the Mashpee Public Library, AmeriCorps Cape Cod, Talbot's Ecological Design, and Mahoney's, and, and, uh, and many others. Um, but uh, I think it's almost time to go enjoy some crafts. So thank you very much for for coming. Now, these butterflies can live their entire life cycle inside the library. However, they will not reproduce when they're in captivity. So we need to set them free so that they can go around the bushes that are attracted that they're attracted to and lay some eggs for the next generation of painted ladies. Okay? All right, so everybody's got their popsicle. We're good? Are we ready to let them go? Are you ready to see them fly? All right. Okay. Okay. Anybody want to do a picture? I do. Here we go, guys. That's a good question. First of all, I'm going to get their food trays out. Good idea. Oh, look at them. Should we wish them good luck? Good luck! Yeah. Good luck! 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 Good lu